That's good. I had to remove some of the very latest data because um, mm, they are not public. Yeah. yeah, that's fine. Because it's not because we have um, protection, but it's just to to give right uh, priorities to the PIs and so a little bit because we need to um, very strongly work on the calibration of the data. So usually it takes a couple of months for the background removal of the F corona and so on. Yeah, I hope this talk encourages a lot of students because everyone is looking to now analyze this data from this revolutionary missions. I will just make this smaller. So you have your afternoon tea ready? Yes. So we will start in about three minutes or so. Yeah. I have some background noise, but you don't hear, hear this, right? No, no. Okay, good. Just a second. Background noise reduction.
Okay, probably we can start. So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to astrophysics webinar at IIA. Uh, I will ask Vagish to introduce today's speaker. So today's talk will be around 45 minutes, but it can go like there's no strict time, timeline, but then after the talk, we will invite the question to the speaker. So Vagish, introduce the speaker. So thank you, Jayan. So hello, everyone. I am Vagis Misra. So on behalf of our Indian Institute of Astrophysics, I welcome everyone to today's talk. This talk is in series of events organized to celebrate the 75th year of our country's independence. It is our pleasure to introduce our speaker, Professor Volker Bothmer, who will be discussing the pioneering exploration of the solar corona after solar corona. Professor Volker Bosmar is a physicist at the University of Virginia and head of the Solar Heliospheric and Space Weather Research Group. He is the coordinator of the European Union FP7 Space Weather Project named APEX, which stands for Advanced Forecast for Ensuring Communication Through Space. He is a project leader of the German contribution to the revolutionary space mission Stereo and Parker Solar Probe, both led by NASA. We know that stereo spacecraft for the first time enabled 3D view of the coronal mass ejections, covering the vast and crucial distance gap between Sun and Earth. And Parker Solar Probe, we all know from the news also that it is the first ever mission almost touching our daytime star, the Sun. Professor Bothmer earned his doctoral degree from University of Göttingen as a Max Planck Society scholarship. And uh, after that, he worked as a ESA research fellow at Netherlands and also Soho Efin project scientist at the University of Kiel. He had led several projects at PI and co-PI from different space agencies. He had been in the science team of NASA Stereo and Parker Solar Probe mission. Professor Bothmer has been recipients of several reputed awards such as NASA Stereo Group Achievement Award for outstanding work in the design, development, test, and launch of the Stereo mission in 2008. He also is the recipient of Neil Armstrong Space Flight Achievement Award in 2018 from the American Astronomical Society for the Parker Solar Probe Team and further NASA Silver Achievement Medal in 2019 and uh, received Julius Bartels medal recently in 2021 for outstanding research in the solar, solar terrestrial science. He had been active as SOC and LOC members in organizing various international conferences, symposia and general assembly of the IAU and EDU, International Astronomical Union and European Geophysical Union. He was the co-chair of the COSPAR subcommission D2E3 from 2004 to 2010. Professor Bothmer had been chairman and member of several proposal reviews, assessment, and scientific advisory board of ESA and NASA activities in space science. Professor Bothmer is an editorial board of uh, is in the editorial board of reputed journals and has been a lead editor of several special issues in those journals. Professor Bothmer has authored two most important books which I have also read through and I found that book is the state of the art review books. One is the, like a book on the solar activity published by Cambridge University Press and another physics of the space weather by Springer. He has mentored several PhD and postdoc who are now leading scientists at various institutes. With this introduction, please join me in welcoming Volker Bothman after the talk. As Jayant announced that we will have a short question and answer session. So now I invite Professor Bosmer to begin his presentation. Please. Um, yeah, I open up my screen. So first of all, I like to say many thanks for the kind words. A very heartily good afternoon to India and congratulations for your 75 years of independent independence state, which is a very high valuable good these days. So I'm also grateful for the uh, previous collaborations with the Indian scientific community, which I enjoyed very much. Um, I will talk today about uh, some of the results and observations of uh, Parker Solar Probe. You see here the spacecraft. I have to check how I get to the next slide, but now I know. Okay. 
So you already introduced me and the title and a lot of things. So I can skip this and go and start the presentation. So indeed, I think um, I have here some um, on my screen. I see this little window, which I see. I would like to, to get rid of actually. Um, okay, I have to go back. This is, I have a little window ahead of my title and um, I don't know why it, that is with WebEx. Um, okay, anyway, NASA is a historic mission and it is the first spacecraft that has flown through the solar corona precisely at 9.33 Universal Time on April 28th last year. It is humanity's first visit of the atmosphere of, this, of a star. Um, the outline of my talk is uh, introduction is, is a bit about the sun, the background, space weather, the solar wind, um, some recent observation about uh, what we know about coronal mass ejection, open questions, details on the Parker Solar Probe mission, its development, objectives, technology, synergies with the orbiter mission of ESA, uh, details about the, our contribution here, our national contribution to the mission, status, latest results, summary and outlook. Um, this is a picture of the corona uh, taken during an eclipse. So in the middle, you see the moon blocking the, the uh, sun. The corona, the white light you see here, is a million times less intense than the sunlight. So it's very faint. And with this increasing distance from the sun, it's even getting fainter, of course. So this light is not a direct emission. It's uh, sunlight scattered at electrons. So the intensity of the white light corona is proportional to the electron number density. So here in, on the uh, bottom right, you see Eugene Parker, and I met Eugene Parker, Parker the first time in 1991 when I picked him up from Hanover Airport. And I was really fearing PhD not to drive the bus to the conference site off road because that would be, have been the end probably of my career, although it didn't have started at that time. And uh, I finished my PhD in 93 and in 98 at the solar wind conference in the US, I met Eugene together with uh, BC Lowe and we discussed the helicity of flux drops in the solar wind. And so I got this at that time, uh, this uh, credit, best wishes to the bus driver because I picked him up, becoming a scientist and adding a new twist to the magnetic field in the solar wind. At that time, I didn't think about this statement, but uh, you will see later the solar probe mission has been recently before launch renamed into Parker Solar Probe Mission, which is the only NASA mission named after a living scientist in the field. So here's a chart giving you some uh, idea that he put together a theory of uh, hydrodynamics and he gave the coronal plasma a given temperature close to the sun and depending on this temperature the expansion and the, the temperatures at Earth of the plasma increase. You can see this here from half a million Kelvin to about four times four million Kelvin and this creates solar wind speeds of uh, in the range of about 200 to uh, a little more than over 1000 kilometers per second. So the main thing is that he published this paper in 1958, which was, was the founding year of NASA, by the way. And um, uh, it has been rejected actually three times. So if you have uh, a rejection of your latest ideas don't give up because sometimes it's important that science is making progress although other people don't believe in your ideas. This happened to Parker and of course the solar wind has 
embedded in a magnetic field, which is due to the uh, prospheric field, which are convected outward with the solar wind. And here you, we look on top of the north pole of the sun, and this is the radius vector towards an observer into the interplanetary medium. And depending on the rotation rate and the speed of the plasma, which is leaving the sun, this means that the origin of this plasma parcel is then rotating to this position and typically at the distance of one astronomical unit at the Earth, we have a, a kind of a spiral or the Parker spiral with an angle of 135 degrees with respect to the direction towards the Sun. So that's the Parker spiral and depending on the solar wind speed, this is decreasing or increasing slower speeds. So it's important to know, to understand that the solar wind is a magnetized plasma. The solar wind has been explored even at times of the Apollo mission. In every Apollo mission there is this foil which has been placed on the moon and uh, these have these foils have collected the particles because the moon has no atmosphere and so solar wind particles have been measured. This has been taken back to the Earth and uh, then there was a big discussion types of the mission planning whether one should put the foils first on the moon and as a second step the US flag and this has you can see this is this has become first and this is a good triumph so you can see that scientists can win against political interests. So here is um, here are measurements of the um, Helios so measurements of the Helios space probe. Helios is shown here to the right. Um, it's a specific shape of this and the reflecting outer material and the boom for, for the magnetometer. Um, it's a rotating spacecraft, no cameras on board. And, uh, it did explore the regime between Sun and Earth from one astronomical unit, that means near Earth orbit, to about 0.29 astronomical unit, which is the orbit of Mercury. And here you see for the first um, orbit around the Sun, the increase in the magnetic field strength when Helios went close to the Sun in terms of the field strength of B. The rest is more complicated, you can neglect that. Here you have the velocity green, the solar wind speed of uh, a given magnetic polarity pointing away from the Sun, and red means um, pointing towards the sun or vice versa, it doesn't matter. And so you see the repetition of fast and slow wind streams during one full solar rotation. Here you see the increase related to these different solar wind streams. You see the general increase with approach towards the sun and here you see the temperature. So this mission has um, greatly improved our understanding of the solar wind and the conditions and its properties between Sun and Earth. So here are some basic parameters we know from that mission, which is the proton speed in the range 300 to 800 kilometers per second density. At near 1 AU, it's just 10 protons per cubic centimeter, which is very, um, very small, even compared to a high vacuum, which has a number which is less than 10 to the 5 particles per cubic centimeter. Temperature of the protons, electron temperature, and the field strength. For comparison, the field strength of the Earth at the equator is around 50,000 nanotests or something like this. So that holds for 1 AU, and then you have the plasma composition. This, this uh, big peak is related to the protons. This minor peak is related to the 4% helium atoms. A few heavy ions we have uh, embedded in the plasma or part of the plasma. And then all the electrons are free and they are about the same number so as a whole it's crazy neutral. Once more the solar wind is a magnetized plasma and it has a fundamental consequences, consequences, consequences for, for the shape of the Earth's magnetic field in, in uh, space. 
because the solar wind particles flow against the Earth's magnetic field. Here you see how it would look if the Earth's magnetic field is considered as a pure dipole with an inclined magnetic axis with respect to the rotation axis and this is how it's into a different shape because of the um, flowing solar wind against the magnetic field. So at the day side it will be compressed to a distance of about 10 Earth radii and at the night side it will be expanded into a long tail. So the Earth is basically permanently under the control of the solar wind and the solar wind is an important, one of the most important ingredients for what we call space weather. So this is not a talk about space weather and so I'm just summing up um, many of the effects. We have the sun as the prime source, we have the solar wind, we have uh, stormy flows I will come to in a moment, we have energetic particles accelerated which impose a threat to astronauts, to electronics on board of spacecraft, to airline passengers and crews. I see. And uh, the solar wind is, is, is causing uh, currents in the ionosphere. So if you see aurora, you, that's a direct witness of the solar wind. But the solar wind is contrary to what is stated in the internet uh, largely, that the solar wind particles are not hitting the Earth's ionosphere and creating uh, aurora directly. but. Uh, there are reconnection processes in the tail of the Earth's magnetosphere and there are electrons accelerated to KV energies and that's the cause of the aurora. But this is not, as I said, a talk on space weather. And these currents affect um, the transatlantic cables, they affect the power grids and can even lead to power blackouts and uh, uh, other effects. So that's important. That's the importance to study the solar wind. And um, uh, here a little bit of a background noise, so that's why I'm um, doing a little bit disturbed, honestly. Here you see a chronograph observation, and this corona, and this is an a bubble plasma actually seen in white light and this is called the coronal mass ejection. It's a new discrete bright feature appearing in the field of view of the chronograph and moving outwards over a period of minutes to hours. That's the traditional definition of the CMEs which have been discovered in the early 70s. So the light of the CMEs which have not been detected earlier that is because they the corona is a million times less intense than the visible sunlight. So you need to go to space to continuously observe the CMEs as we do today. And to the right you see um, uh, the chart which is giving the intensity of the light on the y-axis and the distance from the sun on the x-axis. So that's the orbit. Here we go, we are at the sun and we have the brightness of the full moon, we have the brightness of the K corona, which is seen here, which drops below the F corona. The F corona is just light, which is scattered at dust particles in space, very tiny micron sized dust particles. And you may be familiar with at Earth, you can sometimes see in the ecliptic, around the ecliptic, a, a little shine of light which is caused by the Sodia car light. That's light reflected by dusty particles. So it's important that you have a decrease in the intensity of the coronal, coronal light, which is going below the intensity of light of the sun, especially the F corona. Um, it's important to understand what makes these observations of the corona and of CME so special. And today we, we have developed into a very um, fortunate situation, namely that um, we have the sun here and we have multiple spacecraft around the sun 
from the Earth, we know we have Soho since December 95. We have other satellites like ACE. We have STO doing high resolution coral observations. Proba 2 to name, Proba 3 coming up. We have Steer You Ahead. Steer You Ahead travels around the sun and is almost here today, as you see here in the bottom right, or the red point is, is uh, labeling the position of Stereo A today. And, and the B spacecraft has the same way gone wrong, except that we lost communication to the B spacecraft because of uh, various issues in commanding in 2014. So to the right, you see telescopes, which I contributed to, to the development on board the stereo spacecraft. It's here the EOB telescope with the lid. Um, not going into more of the details today on this, but we observe the sun and the corona from different positions today. And here is one of the fantastic observations covering five different telescopes so to the right there my cursor is that's the equator of the sun and that's the limb of the sun and that's the low corona in EUV and then we have the uh, nearest corona to a couple of solar radii we have the, the coronagraph uh, observations to about 15 solar radii and then we have the interplanetary cameras one and two this is by the way Venus this is the Earth so the five telescopes have provided the first ever complete remote sensing of the sun plasma flows in the sun system and provided full coverage of the CMEs and solar wind streams you see here from the sun originally at the sun until they arrive at the Earth and cause the differences in space weather. That's fantastic. And uh, a closer look on the origin of CMEs is shown here. You see an SDO image, you see a, a region around the sun which is hidden by a disk or an occulta, and then you see the corona seen by Lasco C2 up to about five solar radii, something five to six like this. And you see here a huge. Um, huge expulsion of uh, coronal mass on the left side you see this area here and uh, one comment on the solar storm is that we have the coronal mass ejection that's the ejected plasma we have an emission of electromagnetic radiation which is the flare typically in the uv x-ray regime sometimes gamma rays solar energetic particles up to a couple of gev the radio, sometimes radio wave emissions and these um, energy releases of the sun I combine underneath the general term solar storm so these cause different space weather effects and different different physical processes some CMEs can reach speeds of up to 4000 kilometers I would think uh, this is about uh, this is holding for about uh, 50 events per cycle. Here is a close look of, of, all, of how actually small or limited amount of space the source region of this bigger CME was at the sun. The post eruptive arcase, that's the flare, and the eruption caused a global wave which is propagating almost around the whole sun. So that we all know today that from localized eruptions on the sun because it's uh, it's all a magnetized plasma and uh, because of the Maxwell equations everything is connected magnetically and uh, you can even see here that there are frequent multiple eruptions at the same time so that's our big CME as enormous expansion this is the background on the CMEs and of course the driver of everything is the magnetic field um, if you remember, you might remember that in 2003, October, we had the last extreme uh, geomagnetic storms caused by a very energetic CMEs, which were related to sunspots, showing an emerging flux at the sun. So the 
ever-changing um, magnetic field of inside the sun, which is seen as surface features in the photosphere, is driving variability on time scales of seconds, minutes, hours, months, and the sun and years in terms of the cycle. And here you see that these changes, of course, consequently lead to a very dynamic atmosphere above the photosphere, namely corona, and you have a lot of uh, variability on all time scales. So that's fundamental. And uh, the corona is a, a property which we haven't understood today. Here's a temperature and density profile ranging from the, the sun itself to some thousands and hundreds thousands kilometers in height above the, vis the photosphere. And you see that here is a, at about uh, a couple of 10,000 kilometers in height, the electron temperature increases rapidly and the electron density decreases rapidly. So in this regime here, where the temperature has increased to a million degrees and the density has dropped substantially, we enter into a fully ionized plasma. So the ionization degree of a plasma is based on, can be calculated based on the Sahar equation. That is just a side note. The reason how the temperature, why the temperature increases so strongly and the density drops is not solved and is part of the coronal heating problem, which we still not have understood. So we don't know even today why, what structures the corona, what creates the existing or causes the origin of the corona and what causes the existence and acceleration of the solar wind. Um, there are some ideas which range from waves acoustic wave, shock waves, turbulence, um, different forms of waves. So I think wave is the form of waves. Named <coughs> after uh, Hannes Alfen as a Nobel Prize laureate. That's a specific uh, wave uh, which is um, um, propagating signals along the magnetic field. We have other forms of waves, we have interaction with uh, uh, charged particles creating these ion cyclotron waves. We have uh, currents flowing in the corona, which can, uh, give rise to different, different um, resistivities and uh, different processes. And we have energetic uh, transient processes on various various spatial scales and time scales caused by the connection of opposite magnetic field, namely magnetic reconnection leading to transfer of thermalization of energy into particles and even Bremsstrahlung, etc. So there are different ideas to explain the heating of the corona, but we still don't know the exact reasons today. And one of the reasons we thought is that there are no direct measurements of the solar atmospheric plasmas and fields. And uh, that's why ideas about emission going to the sun date already back to the 1958, which was, as I said earlier, the, the year of the postulation of the theory of the solar wind by Eugene Parker. To the left, you see George Simpson and uh, Van Allen, and uh, I had the pleasure to, to have a publication with George Simpson in the Ulysses mission on the uh, coverage of particle measurements in the poles of the sun. Anyway, to the right, you see various reports have been done, but none of these reports and studies have been successfully during the past decade. It was just the report that we did in 2008, you see here the science definition team, and we put out this report to the left, which is the sun in the middle, a spacecraft concept with a specific design. I will explain later and the many, many passes around the sun. And this concept was based on seven flybys over the years with 24 orbits and periodic passages during a time period of seven years after a launch in 2018. Here's the mission concept in more details. We have the sun here, 
we, we, we base on a launch, we based the concept on a launch end of July in 2018. It was actually shifted, as you may know, to 12th of August. But this doesn't, does not impact much the overall scenario. So launch is here. And the first VF stands for Venus flyby was already taking part in end of September with a launch ship in the mid of October 2018. This brought the spacecraft, every Venus flyby brings the spacecraft closer to the sun. So that means the Venus flyby, you can accelerate the spacecraft, or in this case, in our case, we decelerate the spacecraft a bit, so that it's not going further away from the sun. For seven Venus flybys uh, over the years, and at the end of the mission scenario in 2024, 2025, we aim at going closer than 10 solar radii, which is 6 million kilometers above the photosphere. <coughs> Here you see the time of the launch, it's a little bit above 1AU because the 1AU is just an average value during the year. So that launch was in August when we were a little bit further away from the sun. That's symbolic for the first Venus flyby. That brings us to below 0 0.2 astronomical units. And then the orbit basically stays constant with distance to the sun almost until the next flyby. And we decrease the size and the distance to the sun again. So now we are in, uh, we have five Venus flybys, two to come in 23, 24, and at the end in 24, we will go as close to the sun as 6 million kilometers. That's the mission concept, and to make this a little bit easier to understand, how close the spacecraft is approaching to the sun, and, uh, depicted here the Earth, on scaled onto a football uh, stay a foot arena, and this is one AU. And if we go to 0 0.7 AU, we have Venus orbit 150 kilometers. This is half of the field. And then, as we go close, we, we can come to Mercury orbit, we come to the orbiter, which has been launched in February and 2020, and uh, it's going never closer than 42 million kilometers but it has direct facing telescopes for the sun. Here is two reached about the same distance. And now let's have a look with solar probe, six million kilometers above the photosphere. We are really in the hot area around the goal of the sun. So that's, um, that's for comparison. And uh, on the other hand, the probe has no direct facing cameras on board which makes the orbiter and the probe a very uh, unique opportunity. So here is an uh, um, um, illustration we did for a tournament in Pasadena, California, during one of our concept studies. So it becomes very hot to see this tennis ball here and 1,400 kilometers per second. How do we survive this? Um, I have to go one more back. So this is now the spacecraft design. You see here a heat sheet, with, which has a thickness of about 11 centimeters, and a, radial, and a diameter of a little bit more than two meters. You see the sun. Um, this here is uh, what we call the radiators. Here, heat is radiated into space. So the 1,400 degrees temperatures are on the heat shield in the worst case, or in the in the maximum radiation exposure. And uh, the trick is that, the technical trick used is that inside the spacecraft body, there are six liters of uh, water transferred through the solar arrays. And this is a very clever cooling system. The water is also flying through the radiators. And so the heat is, is going away. And this means that the our Parker solar probe or our spacecraft is protected by a dedicated heat shield and thermal protection system so that the instruments work at room te temperature. That's a great thing. And uh, one instrument is deviating from that concept, which is a plasma 
particle collector here. It's right. sticking above right. the heat shield, and it's made of the very few elements very few like uh, right. molten, which right. is uh, resistible to these high temperatures in the periodic element system. You can see this. And there's another concept which is important to operate the spacecraft. They right. need Depending on the distance to the sun, closest distance, the arrays are uh, hidden behind the heat shield. If the spacecraft is further away, the arrays are folded a little bit out. And if we need more current further away from the sun, the arrays are fully deployed. So that's a very interesting concept, I think, of the mission to give the current and to, to protect the solar arrays. On the spacecraft, there are various uh, particle detectors to provide measurements of the solar ring of energy particles of super thermal and super thermal energies uh, from KV to several uh, hundreds of electron volts. I don't go through the names, but uh, we measure the, the magnetic field of the solar wind with magnetometers, and that's why they to separate from the spacecraft body. And uh, there is one camera you can see here that's called WISP White Imager for Solar Probe. And that I will show you in more detail because that's our national contribution. And what you see here is a direction in the, in the flight. So actually the sun would be here and the spacecraft would fly in this direction. So WISPA, we were able to mount it in flight direction. And so that means the camera observed the corona and solar wind before actually we fly through them. Here are the different, uh, just for completeness, the different, the different uh, instrument suites, energetic particles, magnetic and electric field measurements, radio waves, remote sensing observation provided by the WISPA camera. Um, measurements of particles. It's not important to go into the detail of these measurements. You can also look this up. So that's the summary of the German contribution, which is called seed gauss. That, that is called chronographic German and US Probe plus survey. So at some earlier time, the mission was called first solar probe, then solar probe plus. And you will see in a moment that this has changed to Parker solar probe. So the German contribution is for the wide field imager WISPA on board solar probe. And it's a participation in the development of the camera and the lenses, testings, data analysis, modeling simulation for the mission operation, development and operation of the European data archive and its meta products. Uh, that's the camera in a uh, layout design and uh, here are the feeds this is the body of the camera it has one lip protecting the two uh, lens systems one is here one is here so that's the inner field of view in this direction and that's the larger outer field of view that's the electronic box that's for short some more details so the lenses this is here um, a, ten, a, a 10 meter long um, tube which is uh, has a vacuum which which has a vacuum and inside this tube electric fields can accelerate particles up to velocities of some tens of kilometers per second so i think we used iron and some other silicates and put the lenses here and shoot the lenses for a couple of weeks and then you see how the lenses behave all little craters here and different materials and to make it short, we just selected the lens material best suited based on the analysis of the, uh, the lens, the crater box. And that, that was a, a huge effort to, to simulate the dust environment because a lot of dust, as I said, already in space. Right. So the mass of the camera is about 10 kilograms. This is the size in centimeters. It's a bit shoebox. This is the actual feature of the camera inside the clean room which has been taken before integration to the spacecraft. And here is a simulation 
for looking on top of the sun and you see here the orbit for a 10 solar radii perihelion distance going through the corona. And with these shaded areas in gray, you have the inner field of view and the outer field of view in angular widths around the sun. And you say that the scenery changes substantially. So that's important to take into account when under trying to understand the observations. So com different from other missions with an almost uh, fixed distance to the sun, we have a complete different concept here for the probe and the imaging. And that's how we, it looks if the ecliptic is in the middle of the scenery of the outer telescope and the inner telescope. We call this whisper R O. We call this whisper I. And you see when we are approaching to the sun, the scenery changes dramatically. So the mission is, in terms of the observations, complicated, complex, but on the other hand, very, very exciting. Exciting. So, um, in 2017 fall, we had a workshop in uh, near what near Washington, and you see here Gene Parker staying here in the middle of this picture. That was the moment it was introduced to him that officially the mission has been renamed to Parker Solar Probe, and that's a historic picture of Parker facing not just the space probe, but also our camera whisper in facilities near Washington. And this is why it's called in the title of the slide, Parker meets Parker. And Parker was saying, uh, well, if this, this is a fantastic uh, design and a spacecraft, and this, if the measurements will prove that I'm wrong, I will just write another paper. So then I remember, and this is, the spacecraft shortly before launch at Cape Canaveral, you see here some uh, facts, which is three meter length and the rest and six, almost 700 kilograms is the weight of that spacecraft. And that was put on the 17 uh, meter long uh, heavy dead eye for heavy rocket. In the top here is the Parker spacecraft embedded and it was launched and here you see at the code, the launch trajectory. And that was also a very great moment. And the mission operations are summarized in this. So on board, we have the electronic system and the camera, and they get to the module. And then with a large antenna on, there's one large antenna on board, solar probe, it's going, the data are going to the huge 30 meter antennas of the deep space network. And from this network, with various stations in the US, Spain, and Australia, going to the Mission Operations Center at Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab. And of course, to the uh, WISPA institutions involved in, to our uh, location of the conference. So that's the trend of the data. And uh, what's important is that we have here orbit one to orbit 24. And this red curve or this, this, this uh, ellipse is the first orbit of solar probe. The sun is here in the, in one of the focus points of the ellipse and uh, the earth is here after launch. So we are getting closer around the sun. And what's important is here's Venus flyby in October, uh, 2018, this green, um, part of the ellipse is the time during which data can be transferred to Earth. You can see that there's almost no time to transfer data to Earth in the first orbit. That's why we have to make a second travel around the Sun to use this elevated time, which is depending on the position of the spacecraft to the ground-based network to transfer the data to the ground. And if you compare different ellipses, you see that this time interval is different. This here, yeah, in this case, we have only two intervals, and this dramatically has consequences for the operation of the spacecraft, the collection of the data, and so on. I hope I have given you the idea how complex the different orbits are, and that the uh, collection of data is different during different orbit. 
So Cyberpunk's launch was on 12th August 2018. The launch was very, very perfect because it was just 0.1% difference from the margin of 3%. And that's why the instruments could have been switched on earlier as originally planned. Whisper was successfully switched on 10 September 2018. October 2018 was the first of the seven Venus planned Venus flybys, and already in November 2018, there was the closest ever approach of a spacecraft to the sun to a distance uh, to to a distance of uh, about 25 million kilometers. So here is just a summary of a whisper observation of both telescopes with the Milky Way seen here going through the picture. Uh, going through the, the image and uh, different uh, measurements of protons and helium atoms, heavier ions, electric and magnetic fields. So all the instruments are working and uh, coming back to providing us uh, as a reminder this slide here on the objective of the mission. So the, the big questions are what structures and creates the corona, what causes the solar wind, what accelerates energetic particles. And um, the first results actually have been, been published in December 2019 in this volume of nature um, for all the different for all the different instruments. And uh, here is one uh, important result, which is the proton speed on top of the solar wind um, and the angle of the magnetic field to the right. We have the density, we have the radial velocity, we have the tangential velocity and the normal velocity components. Most important is that you see all these spikes here in the data and I will try to explain what that means. So that means a lot of turbulence, a lot of directional changes that we discovered or explored in the solar winds, which are nicely illustrated in this cartoon here. So we call these um, directional changes and kinks in the magnetic field of the solar wind jets of switchbacks. And you see here an animation that why it's important to uh, this, these directional changes actually we think are very important uh, telling us giving us information on the origin and nature of the solar wind. So here are different ideas, how do these directional changes, which we now call switchbacks, they originate. So we could think of reconnecting feed lines, creating kinks. We can create small flat flops. We can create ripples and waves and turbulence. So there are a lot of uh, theories and we have to figure out how this connects to the origin of the solar wind. Um, here is one of the spectacular ideas. So you have here the magnetic field strength, which is increasing around closest approach of the sun in 2020. And uh, you have the speed of the solar wind, which is not very fast. It's in the range two to 400 kilometers per second. And if one looks at when do these patches of um, directional changes occur that can be pretty good related to the uh, how to say the um, mapping back of features on super granular size in the solar photosphere and the overlying corona. So that's currently one idea that the borders of the super granulation that the solar some of the solar wind originates there and creates these directional changes. Coming to WISPER now, it works perfectly. And uh, you see here to the left, so these, these um, white, um, white perspective of the camera, zero degrees. This is normal to the ecliptic. You see that you're, to the mounting of the camera on board the spacecraft, the ecliptic is a little bit shifted to the north in one full image. So that's the image of the inner telescope and that's the outer telescope. Here is the Milky Way. I think this is, I have to check Venus. Um, this is a coronal streamer. The sun is somewhere here. And 
Here is a white stripe we found in the images, which is because of the dust trail of asteroid Theta. Theta. There is a mission, Japanese German mission, the next year is going to explore Theta. And uh, you can imagine that the calculation of the dust in the orbit of Phaeton is of interest for this scientific exploration. Here's a movie that we put together for 2018. So we have the streamers here, you have the Milky Way wandering through the outer field of view. And if it repeats, I have to play this once more, you see a bubble coming out of the streamer and you see a lot of details and this bubble you can see here in the whisper images can be very simulated on both by Fluxrock and uh, this is actually dating back to the first series of us, Marubashi and Bolaga and others in 98 when we postulated that the CME is at the structure of these magnetic platforms. So amazing to see that this is verified and justified. And there's another important thing to take into account when looking at the whisper images, because from the Earth, we have Venus orbit, we have Mercury orbit, and we have in these orbits, um, they are all full of dust particles. That means if we have a telescope, a chronograph looking towards the sun, we always have stray light sources going into the, into the image we don't like to have. And when we have solar probe, which is different, we fly close to the sun and we get rid of these dust sources. So that means we have unprecedented observations of CMEs close to the sun. And we could derive already the existence of a dust-free zone because of the heating of the dust particles of various sources, interplanetary asteroids, comets, etc., planets, that uh, with some distance the particles, the dust particles get heated and they melt. And uh, on the other hand, with some distance, some are transported by photons out of the solar system. So that's uh, all, also a complex subject. The dust I was talking about is a very important stray light source, the F corona, and this is an, a whisper in a image where the F corona in the middle, here's the ecliptic, you see that this is almost symmetric, the, the stray light around the ecliptic, but if the this dust a scattered light is not removed, you cannot observe the coronal streamers, the solar wind and coronal mass ejection, as you see in the same image, which is um, a reconstruction and a removal of the stray light in this image. So the image and processing is a very important aspect of the mission concept and that's why it takes a couple of time until the data are officially released. There is no protection but we just need sophisticated modeling because the background you can imagine changes from image to image because of the changing scenery. Here's a combined inner and outer full view taken in different positions in the orbit. So the sun is in the middle, we don't see it because um, that's the view of the sun, of course, because it's too bright. And to the right, you see coronal streamers, you see bright saturated objects like Venus and Mercury. You see Earth is a bright object, you see the Milky Way. And there's a bright dust strike line going through the whole scenery and that is matching the orbit of Venus. So we, with the um, potential of the resolution in terms of stray light or whisper for the first time we can resolve the dust uh, distribution in the orbit of planets and other objects. So, as I said earlier, we always go closer to the sun if we have a Venus flyby. And one of the ideas in 2020 was to use the Whisper camera to look at the surface of um, Venus. And here you can see that the day side, which is in sunlight, is very bright. So that's, uh, we don't expect to have any good observations. And this is what we got. So the sunlight side is, is hidden here, but this is the night side of Venus. 
And here you can see a streak, which is caused by the impact of dust particles on spacecraft materials. That's a known process. So that's just the dust particle here. And uh, there are stars yeah. in the background. These are all streaks caused by secondary effects of uh, dust impacts on the spacecraft. There's nothing to uh, speak about this, just for your information. And what you see here, this dark area is um, very interesting because that's a highland of Venus. And if you know a little bit about Venus, you know that the surface temperatures are at about 450 degrees. And this area, the highland, is a little bit cooler at a temperature of about 400 degrees. So we did not uh, think that we ever get the surface structure because uh, Venus is, the atmosphere is um, sulfur and cloudy and uh, only radars of previous missions have provided us with detailed surface structures. So the distance was taken, well, uh, when the image was taken, was at about 830 kilometers, which has been used to capture Venus. And completely saturated day side, of course, but visible structures on the night side. So that means we had to test the active pixel sensor bandpass to see whether this is actual surface emission. And there is a paper by Brian Wood and co-authors which has just been released. You can find this information if you go to the Parker Solar Probe website and look at the news archive. So here is our whisper images with different features. This is called the Aphrodite Terra um, area on Venus. And this is a radar image of the Gala Magellan mission. And you see how this compares. So currently, we can even do uh, some planetary science with WISPA, which is uh, amazing. Another amazing movie of uh, coronal structures, Venus and transients, has been taken during the encounter 8 in April 2021. You see a lot of wave activity. You see uh, features of different plasma origin and uh, small islands and bigger structures. And a lot of things we currently try to understand better. Well, what I thought about the, about the corona, that it's uh, pretty much consisting of static structures as streamers and more uh, great greater or large scale eruptions is probably not correct. It's dynamic on all time scales. This is one image of the internal structure of a CME and you can see really looking into a flux rope which is amazing. This planet mass inside the middle in the background. So that's uh, giving you some ideas. And the whisper observations pretty good uh, compared to the current theories of the plasma heat ejections and the origin models simulating the origin of coronal mass ejections. So that's a big point. And uh, there's something else when we take the point here. And um, this is this is the the. Let's see if I can run, get this running. Um, approaching the sun, the field to field changes. So that means if this would be coronal streamers in the field of the, of the camera, it spreads if you go closer and the field of view narrows. And this is actually what's happening in uh, the sequence in August and April 2021. And you see the coronal streamers a camera and some of these go go out of they walk out of the field to the top and bottom and then was uh, evidence as you can see here in the stand image of the of the coronal streamers that these have been taken shortly before the first ever passage through the corona so we can deduce this from the field strengths measured the density and the velocity um, for this day, for April 28, 29, 30 of April 2021, and the plasma beta is this year. This is the alphenic Mach number, and these are energetic particle measurements. But most important is that 
the blue curve here is on top of the black curve. And that means that the velocity of the magnetic waves, the alpha waves, is higher in this gray shaded time interval, this small interval here and this interval here. And that means that the solar wind is still caught by the magnetic field of the sun. That means the corona, the magnetic structures, reach out and hold the field and the solar wind cannot escape free. So that's the evidence for the passage the first time through the solar corona, the alpha Mach number. And this is pretty close to what we actually postulated ahead of the mission in the design of the mission. To which closest approach do we need to go? We have here 100 solar radii. Here is the distance of Earth. Here is the distance of Venus. And the black, the blue line, still the old name. But anyway, it's going below 10 solar radii. And uh, we have here a modeling of the solar wind speed and the alpha wave speed of the magnetic waves. And you can see at about below 20 solar radii somewhere we expect that the alpha wind speed is above the solar wind speed. And that's uh, important. That is what we actually found. So we entered the region where solar wind origin animation of the spacecraft flying to this regime near the sun entering for the first time the corona so that's not a static surface around the sun it's in waves, but it's at about below 20 solar radii and uh, this is what we found is consistent so if you look on the website in the news archive you can find references to publications on these subjects and uh, that's just a reference to go there it's very nice and then you can also go to this website which is our data server and you find movies and data to do science you can go there that's the C project website the data are always becoming public at latest six months because we need that time to process them and then they put you can get all the data either from our site or from the original whisper so the movies and animations and so on and today this is the position of parker solar probe in march as of now you see here we have just gone through these green ellipses are all the previous encounters we did successfully and just on 25th February we were at the 11th perihelion at a distance of 8.5 million kilometers. We will have the next perihelion June 2022, the following one September and another one in December this year and the next, next of the seven Venus flyby number six is just occurring fall of next year. So as I said, the I the activity of house. So there's a complex operation of WISPA due to increasing solar activity and variable distance to this. So all the instruments are working nominally and it's important to have this diagram in mind. The eleventh encounter around the sun. We have, we have all often very unique um, moments in time where we have can make use of multi-point observations. So here's the sun. This is the path of the solar probe. That's the viewing position of stereo A. That's from the Earth. And that's from the orbit. And so this is the equator of the sun in blue and that's the move of the spacecraft above the solar surface, the photosphere as seen from Earth for two days during period. So that can be used this time interval. It's a unique opportunity for coordinated uh, and analysis with ground-based observatory and other space. And just during that um, encounter, so encounter is, is going close to the sun, orbit is a full ellipse around the sun, in period, and we saw this huge, huge um, prominence erupting with the CME. You can see in the right, and uh, this CME did 
it, a part of it did hit Parker Solar Pop and the data are just great. So a little bit of a summary of the solar probe discoveries. So from the Earth's orbit, we went closer and closer to the sun, discovery of switchbacks, discovery of their switchback origin, likely in the supergranulation, or eventually through different processes. Um, first passage into the corona last year, and then we are waiting closest approach in 24 and 25. So summing this up, or giving you a little bit of an outlook in a paper some years ago, we tried to predict the plasma and field values of the solar wind, also in connection to the solar cycle evolution. And this is the data from the last cycle and just projected mirrored into cycle 25 we have currently, and then double this to get to this curve and how size of the activity would mean this dash line. So if I take the actually sunspot number, this is the red circle, and this falls into the just the simple mirroring of the last cycle slope. But to make the point here, we are uh, getting into exciting times. If we go to the maximum and we will expecting very, very fundamental new measurements coming up from the mission. So here's a summary of all the things I found interesting. So Parker Solar Pope has encountered the sun. It's 11 helium in February 25. And the Earth's instruments work nominal. And the data are coming down to Earth until 1st of May this year. The data volume is much larger than we expected. It's about double because of the that sophisticated operation we were doing of the instruments and the reception on the ground. First results published in Nature some time ago and of plenty of publication in other journals. There's evidence for dust-free zone between 3 and 19 solar wind solar wind measurements show a high degree of turbulence with switchbacks and correlations with the sizes of supergranules in the corona photosphere. PSP has flown the first time ever through the corona. April 28, 20, last year. WISP has proven the magnetic flux of nature of CMEs and provided unprecedented observations of the fine structure. It's a fantastic coronal microscope. The next two flybys of Venus in 23 and 24, which shift the orbit closer to about 6 million kilometers to the sun. Um, so at this distance, we face temperatures up to 1,000 and the spacecraft will finally reach a speed of 700,000 kilometers per hour, which is about solar wind speed of 200 kilometers per second. Yes. That means from getting to Bangalore, this means we just take about 45 seconds. Finally, the measurements will certainly provide further clues to unravel uh, our understanding of the origin of the corona and acceleration of the solar wind. And uh, that's the moment when I'd like to thank you for your um, um, participation and I uh, hope you got some useful information. And last not least, um, I'd like to say that in these difficult times, science is highly important to peacefully cooperate and uh, really discredit the current situation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, uh, for showing this exciting results from the purpose of the probe and uh, our future perspective from the mission. Uh, there are a lot of nice data actually to be analyzed from the whisper also. Uh, I invite audience to ask question. Uh, so raise your hand, and if you are not able to raise your hand on the, uh, so may, you can also ask on the chat. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I have the question for the switchback. So in the switchback, which uh, is like a zigzag motion in the solar wind, do means do we have some study of composition at that point of time? How the solar wind composition is varying? Is it similar to 
फोटोस्टेरिन कंपोजिशन और कोरोनल कंपोजिशन um no the reason is that uh, for solar probe we don't have composition measurements because um time of flight unit on this spacecraft is is a technically almost impossible to fly for time of flight you need to collect uh, a lot of a lot of measurements over a given interval and this is not in in compliance with the time resolution of and the mission i would think one has to go back to the ulysses mission where switchback have also been measured and where's the solar composition instrument on board a dedicated one okay, yeah so thank you and my then i can ask the next question then right? sure. sure. so i have another question regarding the solar energetic part so if we are going closer to the sun as the mission is reaching closer to the sun we getting some solar energetic particle which have like different uh, characteristic than what we observe at one au that's correct so uh, one of the discoveries i haven't touched today is the presence of energetic particles we are unable to see further away from the sun and uh, many can be used as a measurement can be used to um study back corrections to type 3 events and the uh, um, events on the smaller scales that's good yeah. and in one slide i think you have showed the dust free region closer to the sun so is that dust free region means uh, is due to the high temperature closer to the sun or means what are the theories behind that why we are observing dust free region the idea is that the, the heat the sun melts these particles and also the photons throw them out away from the sun the photon pressure so yeah so raise your hand if you have a question or put it into the chat box yes uh, professor ashok kambasta so unmute yourself and and ask question please. okay okay can you hear me yes yeah actually uh, i just wanted to uh, uh, you know kind of comment about this dust free uh, region uh which you mentioned you know and also the dust around venus uh, i remember uh, from some old observations you know uh, somewhere in 1980s from some japanese group where uh, during some total solar eclipses they had reported about uh, uh, presence of circumsolar uh, dust ring at around 4 solar radii uh, so uh, from these observations which you report here it looks like uh, uh those were not anyway uh, probably uh, you know uh, present uh, uh, or maybe the, there was some kind of uh, uh, confirmation was not there uh, you know from these observations which you report here so yeah, do that, you have any comments on that yes that's a, a fantastic comment because we had this idea of these onions um surfaces around the sun um which are full of uh, dust particles in different layers but we don't find them so far correct okay. i i don't see any other okay there is a question on chat box uh, that is other so i will just read the question when you mention about this and the mention of parker solar probe to work correctly can similar technology be used for satellite around earth for protection against geomagnetic storms that's not the uh, scope of the mission so because the first of all the data are not coming back in almost real time second we we have different scenes and neither the solar orbiter nor the nor the parker solar probe mission is a kind of space weather exploration thing so it will provide fundamental information helping us to better understand space weather 
but uh, it's not a dedicated mission as is the current concept of an L1 mission. I should name your mission, especially Aditya, which, which will be a very great mission for L1 once it's launched. And um, then, of course, we have the plannings in Europe for the L5 mission video by ESA. Okay. Yeah, uh, I missed. I think the Deepankar has a raised hand. So, this is Deepankar, please. Thanks, uh, Volker, for a very nice journey <laughs> through the solar wind. Uh, so, I was just wondering, I don't follow uh, all the uh, all the data from Parker Pro, uh, Pro yet. Uh, is there some uh, you know improvement in our understanding about the temperature and isotropy? Great. This is not my special uh, field of research, that's why I didn't include it, but uh, there are a lot of uh, theories into papers. Maybe you can look them up in APJ or ANA and the anisotropies of uh, the, the, um, the particles and the uh, heat ink of the plasma. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great uh, you know, potential of this, uh, because you know, we are going through the you know, the entire solar wind and uh, whatever, a lot of models were there and models were ahead of observations after, you know, all the earlier observations, I was just wondering. Okay, thanks. I will try to look at it. Good point, not included. Okay, uh, there's a question on the, on the chat box from the Ritesh Patel. Uh, what is the future of Parker Solar Probe after the planned number of orbit? To continue to go closer to how good will the whisper instrument contribute more to the observation given the increasing streaks of the images? This is a question coming also back on and off again, and uh, it's very important. Actually, this depends on the technical status of the whole spacecraft and the instruments and the fuel. Uh, which is which is left over. So the fewer trajectory correction maneuvers are needed, the more fuel there is. And uh, I think that that will be depend on a decision in 2024. Okay, okay. I see that uh, Bukish uh, again has a raised hand. So you have a question? Go ahead. Bukish? Yeah. So. Yeah. And so, as we have studied a lot of like uh, tracking of CMH in the heliosphere using the heliospheric image on board stereo, so in that we could actually track the enhanced density feature, probably the C3 region. So, do we expect to uh, like we can better track coronal flux like the flux probe in the measure from the Parker solar probe whisper? So, because that is the most important, and that we lack in the previous mission stereo. So, how we better we are able to do that? Actually, we are working heavily on this aspect because on the interpretation of the white light uh, observations taken, the other space around stereo A and uh, uh, so will help us a lot. So, yeah, we are trying to, to resolve the fine structure of CMEs. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question fully correctly. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah, it's okay. So, I was more concerned about uh, magnetic flux rope tracking. Ah, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think the, the, the things we see are just uh, simplified uh, C and uh, there's a lot of um, curvature, kinking, bending, inhomogeneous um, geometries involved and a lot of more interaction in the interplanetary space than we saw before. Okay, yeah, thank you. So, Jayant, I can ask one more question. There are some other questions, so I will come back to you. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. So there is a question by Abhijit on the chat box, and he asked that my question is about that temperature the probe has with, with us too. So till now it has experienced around 1500 Kelvin uh, centigrade, and the, the maximum is it could stand as 2500. So 
can it happen that due to the, some coronal activity there could be a sudden rise in the temperature which could not exceed the limit which could exceed the limit of the temperature of the parker prop and if that happens uh, what are the backup plans or what will happen to you it's not happening because we face the radiation temperature which is yes. 6000 degrees on in the photosphere about and uh, decreasing with increase uh, this from the sun the, the other higher temperatures of the corona are just not not realized because of the slow uh, low number density of particles in the, transferring the heat okay yeah thank you very much i see that uh, Deepankar and Professor Ambassador again raised the hand, so I go uh, first with uh, Deepankar. Uh, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. I think it's a, a sort of continuation with what Vagish was mentioning about your flux rope uh, geometry. So you mentioned about stereoscopy, so different vantage point observation, and it will be nice to uh, you know reconstruct it, the form of your model which you proposed many decades back. So uh, what is the sort of uh, plan. I know Whisper, uh, you know, it's, it's quite challenging because of the different uh, imaging capabilities of uh, different vantage point observations. But uh, are there uh, definite plans for reconstruction, 3D reconstruction of any of these? I must say yes, because um, know a lot of uh, groups working on these different fields, but as I said, the data are just so large that uh, there's ample uh, ample possibilities for collaboration, and uh, we are just totally busy in the mission operation and collecting of the data and understanding that uh, we haven't gone uh, further steps. If you like, everybody is very welcome. There is no protection of the data, and um, it's a it's a good point. Yeah, thanks, Volker. And because you know, uh, I mean, as you mentioned, for our Aditya mission, uh, you know, some of the younger uh, students are looking at reconstruction of of uh, these uh, structures. Uh, with uh, now they have enabled you know KCOR field of view and you know, uh, other field of view for three D reconstruction because that's our aim. Uh, looking at the inner corona, but uh, it is naturally important to extend it to the outermost uh, heliosphere. So it will be very good if you could participate in some of these also. So maybe we will we'll get in touch with you. Yeah, we should start looking at whisper data. Um, very exciting to look for collaborations. Thank you. Thank you. So, so probably we can take a couple of more questions. Actually, earlier I saw that Sambista had a raised hand, but if he's around, he can ask. Uh, you can ask the question, but I don't see him, see him around. So, hello. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, Vakish, you can go ahead. And uh, you are muted, Vakish. So actually, the jet drag motion, which we see much closer to the sun, may be within the orbit of Mercury. So it, can it be due to also the effect of solar rotation within the Savalvenics like uh, radius? So how, how much is the importance of this rotation, solar rotation, that can that create this jet drag? Or looking this non-radial profile closer to the sun, non-radial solar wind, can we try to understand maybe spin down rate and something jig-jag, something like this. Uh, indeed, studies which uh, map the position of the spacecraft back to the photosphere and low corona, and uh, we have phases of co-rotating uh, rate with the sun itself, and uh, it's, it's, it's almost in work to map the things back, and that's, an, as I said, the last orbit um, encounter 11 with the ground based observation capability is just amazing. There are different ways to map it back, and there are different um, modelings of the magnetic field structures. Yeah, okay, so thank you. Okay. Uh, I don't see any raised hand and uh, no question in the chat. I, I probably want to ask a question again related to the dust. So, in your uh, that whisper image from the both side of the sun, uh, there's a clear 
dust around the Venus orbit. But uh, in the same image there, I see the Mercury and around the Mercury that was not so clear. So it's again because it is, it is heated up. Uh, yeah. That's correct. So the, the dust trail of the Mercury orbit we didn't see. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I I don't see any. Uh, I think the Wagish and uh, the Pankra still has a raised hand, but I think it is from earlier uh, questions. So, yeah, okay. Uh, so we thanks again to Professor Botmar for this exciting uh, presentation on then showing the, all the new results from uh, Parker Solar Probe and also showing the future prospect and this on the giving the answer in so much detail. So thank you very much, Professor Wagish. You want to add something? So I really thank Professor Bothmer to take time out of his schedule to be with us and make this presentation. And we look forward for possible collaboration with this for C Gauss project. Yeah, so thank you so much, Professor Bothmer. Thank you too for your attention. Thank you everybody for attending the webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you all. It's, it's great. Collaborations are very, very exciting. Have a good time. Yeah. Bye, everyone.